I see you guys. You can move your camera down a touch, and then we can see everybody. The camera down. Oh yay! Hi, dear Lake. So we have everyone. So we can start. Who's ready to start? Thumbs up if we can start. All right. So I've actually asked my friend Misha. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, teachers in the schools, if we can all start with our mics muted, that would really, really help. I don't know why the audio is not working. How do we do that? How do I mute it? There should be a little cord dangling from the back of your unit. You can actually just hit mute on there, or you can also mute yourself right on the tablet. Yep, yeah, there, I think everyone's muted. Okay, so welcome to our very first Connected North Polar Bears International session. We have um, friends that are in Churchill, Manitoba, and oops, we've got, I can't see the note. It's I I'm I'm if you're having trouble here well if you're having trouble hearing it's not going to help. Um, I hope they know to unmute uh, log off and log back in again. Um, so we're what we're going to do is do a shout out from all the schools and we've um, I'll call on you and you'll say um, hi i'm mally i'm from newmarket and i'm really excited to learn about polar bears in their ecosystem so you can say what school you're from um, what community you're from and what you're excited to know about polar bears so we'll go to fort um to washoe in fort severin first so can you unmute your mic? Yeah. All right, go ahead. You can introduce your class. We are the grade three and four school students of Washoe Cree Nation School. We live in Fort Severn. It is nice to meet you. And it's wonderful to meet you, too. I've heard so much about you from Katie. Thanks for that great introduction. Okay, over to my friends at Exarni Middle School in um, Iqaluit, Nunavut. Ryan, do you have a student? Oh, there you go. Awesome. Okay. Um, we're from Kumi, Nunavut, and we are like Upsonite Middle School. And what are you excited to learn about polar bears? Um, I'm excited to learn about uh, what color their skin is underneath their fur. Well, I hope we can solve that mystery for you. Thank you, Exarni. Um, over to Guchla in Carcross, Yukon. Would, would someone like to introduce yourselves? Okay, I, I'm going to do it for us because we have four classes in here. That's fine. Okay, so um, this is K4 all the way to grade three from Carcross, Yukon at Gochka Community School. And we're excited to see the polar bears and the kindergartens are really excited to see the tundra bungies. They're really excited to see those. You know that, okay. I'm sure they can have that wish granted. Thank you very much for your, for your, what you're wondering about, about polar bears and tundra buggies. So over to my friends at Mind Center, and thank you for joining us during your lunch. Stand up, Kirkin. Hi, we are from Mind Center. Okay, just stop a minute. Sarah, can you move the mic closer to her, please? No. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Hi, we are from Mind Center School in Ontario, and we are excited to see the... <laughs> presentation today we love polar bears thank you Kerrigan great to see you at Mind Center and Deer Lake can you hear us now 
Okay, I'm not sure what's happening there. We'll get Tanisha to look into that. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to the people from Polar Bears International, um, and they are all the way up in Carcross. So over to you guys. Well, welcome, everybody. It's great to be connected with you today. My name is DJ Kershoffer, and I'm the Director of Field Operations for Polar Bears International. And we're joining you from Churchill, Manitoba. We're just a little ways outside of town. And we're on a Tundra buggy. We're on a polar bear monster truck. And we actually have a polar bear just outside. Are we doing it? Nope, we still have a polar bear just outside the window taking a nap. So we'll be showing you a little bit of that today, as well as talking about the polar bears. This program today for people that may be joining outside will last about 60 minutes. And we'll have some time for some questions at the end. And we're Definitely excited to get to your questions mm. today and, and the little preview there, your questions sound great. So we'll, we'll be sure to hit those for sure. So I'm not alone here, as you can see, I brought some friends along today and I will let them introduce themselves. So Tia, go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tia Beckshaw. I'm a scientist with Polar Bears International. And I talk to a lot of people like you guys all around the world. And, talk to them about polar bears and why we want to keep them around. And I also do research. So I try to find new ways that we can look at polar bear health. On to you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Galicia. I'm from York University in Toronto, Ontario, uh, in Canada. And I'm a PhD student uh, looking at foraging ecology and looking at what polar bears are eating. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about that today and some of the different uh, things about polar bears and their adaptations. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Birch. I am an education coordinator with Connected North and Taking It Global. Uh, Taking It Glo Global has been working with uh, Polar Bears International since around 2012. So I'm very honored to be sitting on this panel of experts and helping everyone come together and learn about polar bears and climate change. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to help everyone facilitate that and hopefully get all if you have any other questions, Mally can text them over to me if you email them over to her. And yeah, you guys actually have a unique uh, position this time for this webcast because you are some of the schools are coming to us from the Arctic where polar ba bears naturally live. So um, yeah, we're hoping to learn a little bit from you guys as well through your questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're wondering, where are all of you guys? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at a map. I think we might have a map there. Very cool. So I'm not sure. I guess Churchill is kind of off the map there. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah. So we're kind of in the middle there, maybe. Um, sorry, we should have looked at that before. But uh, we're, we're kind of in the middle there. And you guys are all around us. It's very cool to be connecting with folks that are a little bit further north of us as well as some further south down in Toronto. So this is great. Um, are we gonna go school to school then or we're- I think we kind of did, but I, okay. I do want you guys to start thinking about as we progress through the webcast, thinking about because you have such a unique experience, some of the schools being very far north and maybe you have some experiences with polar bears and you might also have noticed changed in your communities so i want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind and maybe share with us a little bit about your community uh when, towards the end when we have a question and answer time and the scientists might even have questions for you so mm -hmm. be prepared so maybe to start us out so we can maybe help jog some questions maybe we should talk mm. to make them so special so I think we're going to start out with a really cool thing that Melissa is going to introduce, and she's got some props here. Melissa, awesome. what can you tell us about polar bear feet? Polar bear feet. Um, so they have these pretty big uh, paws. They're about 30 centimeters. You guys can probably think of a dinner plate, and that's kind of the size of their paws. You'll notice they have a lot of fur on their paws. And so they'll have a lot of fur between their toes and that will help them when they're walking on the sea ice, when they're traveling, looking for their food, uh, to try to help them not slip. And then they'll also have, if you look at the underside, they'll have these black foot pads and they'll have little bumps on them. And that, again, is really useful for bears when they're traveling and to help them not slip when they're traveling along the sea ice. Do their feet get cold, Melissa? Uh, the fur is really good. Uh, useful for that. So it's kind of 
used to help add some friction, but it's also used to help keep their feet and their toes a little warmer, uh, especially when there's a lot of snow out and when they're walking along the ice. So I understand that polar bear's food is probably pretty slippery. What would they use to maybe grab onto their food? Sure is slippery. I do have a prop for that. No so way. That will be <laughs> Let's see That's great. So if you guys look, this is a polar bear claw. And so there's a couple of cool little features that you'll notice. So they're a little bit shorter and then you'll notice how they're kind of curved. And then you'll notice how it's pretty pointy right there. And so these claws are great to help them catch their prey and then also to hold on to their prey that can be quite slippery. Um, and they're also, also useful when they're walking along the sea ice, um, helping them climb over blocks of ice, climb in the snow as well as sometimes when there's not any snow, help them kind of climb up and, and go down some of those steep slopes and some of those steeper rocky areas um, in some places in the Arctic. So we also have another claw with us, sure don't do. we? And this is kind of interesting <laughs> because maybe some of you have grizzly bears or barren ground grizzly bears nearby. Um, these two claws are very different, aren't they? Yeah, so you'll notice, I'll put them kind of on one of them. So the polar bear, which would be the one on the bottom, is a little bit shorter. And you'll notice that the grizzly paw, or sorry, grizzly claw is a little bit uh, longer. And both are really useful uh, for helping them with their food sources. Polar bears are eating uh, quite different prey species. I won't get into that. We don't want to let the surprise out of the bag. The answer. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but their claws are very useful in what they're trying to capture and their food sources. So it's a great uh, comparison between grizzly bears, which would be this claw right here, and then polar bears, which would be that shorter curved angle and then that pointy uh, part at the end of the claw really help hold on to their prey a little bit better. Very cool. Thank awesome. you. Now, Taya, let's talk about what make polar bears so iconic, their color. Their color. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, sure, there might be some some white black bears out there, but pretty much polar bears. Everybody recognizes the polar bear mm -hmm. because of its white fur. That's Can true. Can you tell us a little bit about the fur? We actually have a patch of fur here. Now, if you're from up north, I'm sure you've seen polar bear fur before. So if you ever have a chance to see a polar bear fur, have a look way down here. And you'll find that underneath, there's actually this downy, soft kind of woolly hair. And that's kind of like a sweater. So they're wearing a sweater underneath. And then above, you have this other kind of hair. It's stiffer. Uh, it's more straight. And it's called the guard hair. And that works kind of like a windbreaker or a raincoat on top of the other one. So they are, they're really nicely wrapped up. Yeah. Pretty important in a place that's as cold as the Arctic, huh? Oh, for sure. Even on a day like what we're having here right now. I don't know if you guys can tell, but the whole, uh, the whole bucky is actually <laughs> rocking right now because it's so windy. Uh, the bears will just hunker down, maybe put a paw over their, their nose and just be nice and warm and snuggly and yeah, wait for, for the wind to die down again. I wonder if now would be a good time to take a look at that polar bear and see them all hunkered we down and snuggling should. up. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Now, if you look towards the middle of your screen, again, like Tess said, it's pretty windy out there. So even our camera is being blown around, but there is a white blob out there and that is a real polar bear. It's taking a nap. And I suppose some of you that have polar bears near your communities, you may know this. Those that don't, on a windy day, polar bears like the windy days probably about as much as we like the windy days. You know, you may just want to kind of crawl in and take a nap on, a, on the days that have nasty weather. Well, today is pretty nasty. So this polar bear is just taking a nap there in the willows. So if it gets up, KT will be sure to pop the camera over and we'll be able to see it. But for now, it's nap time. Mm -hmm. But we didn't get to skin color, did we there? Oh, so right. we have this bear, it's all white on the outside. Mm -hmm. Its fur is covering pretty much everything, but what color is a polar bear's skin? Yeah, so I think one of you also asked this question and we'll get to it already now because unfortunately this is a tan skin, so you can't really count on the color here. But if you were to go outside and uh, carefully take a look at the polar bear out there, and look in between the hairs, you'd see that the skin is actually black. And the reason for this, we're not entirely sure. 
uh, but maybe it's to, you know, black is really good at absorbing sunlight and the heat. So it's one way of keeping, you know, the taking all the warmth out of the sun that you can. But maybe it's also to use as UV protection, again, from the sun's rays. Because mm. in the summertime, it could be very sunny. Mm -hmm. And in the wintertime, it can be really dark for a long <laughs> period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so I think we can move on to the next thing. Uh, this is something that we don't see very often, is it? The polar bear's tongue. Right, that's true. So it's not just, you know, it's not just on the body itself that the, that the skin is black. It's actually also inside the polar bear mouth. Um, so if a bear is to stick out its tongue at you, you'll see that each bear has their own individual pattern but it's usually either, well, it can be anything from mostly pink to completely dark. It's like a black blue color and it can be any kind of, well, pattern in between those two. So often it's kind of mottled. Hmm. Interesting. How did you see the inside of a polar bear mouth? <laughs> Very careful. Okay, we won't get into that. Yeah. <laughs> so near the mouth, of course, is the rest of the head. And we have an example here. On yeah. The Table. Sure. So maybe we can talk a little bit about the polar bear skull. Mm, we can talk a lot about polar bear skulls because they are awesome. Where should Whoop. we start? Hang on. There. You want help here? No, it's it's all right. Okay. I got it. Uh, so this one is a replica of a big uh, skull from a big male. And on the skull, you can see a lot of the excellent adaptations that polar bears have for living up here. Um, well, maybe you'll sure. hold the lower hold jaw. The lower yeah. Jaw. <laughs> Do we have both? We kind of have both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so first of all, polar bears really, of course, they have eyes like we do, and their eyesight is more or less the same. But what they're really relying on is their sense of smell. And so polar bears have a really big nose. And in order to make it even bigger, they have these structures inside of their nose that actually make the surface of the nose even bigger. And that just means that they, uh, their sense of smell is quite extraordinary. They also have, oops, let's see, a very long skull. And I don't want to give away the prey either, but this is related to the food that they eat. And we can talk more about that later on. Mm -hmm. Very long, narrow skull I compared have a to the other bears. Oh, sorry, from mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Carlton's class in Y Vale. They're wondering how strong are the polar bear's teeth and jaws? Are they very strong? That's a good mm. question. So, hmm, let me think. They are very strong, but it's not the strongest fight that you find in the animal world, in the animal kingdom. I think that belongs to the hyena, oh, as really? far as I remember. Really? You know, because they also crunch through bone, and polar bears don't usually do that. Mm -hmm. So their yeah. prey is kind of soft. Mm, it is. Are we getting hints here? Yeah. We're getting clues. <laughs> they okay. like soft food. Of these clues? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question, though. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think what we can do is move on to moms, moms and cubs next. Everybody loves to talk about moms mm -hmm. and cubs. And I've got uh, the uh, great fortune of being able to go study moms and cubs up in the Arctic, up in northern Alaska, not too far from, as we just found out, a little chunk of the Yukon that touches uh, the Beaufort Sea up there, as well mm -hmm. as some time over in the Norwegian Arctic. And moms and cubs are very important to this whole polar bear uh, uh, species here. Because if you don't have baby polar bears, you don't get big polar bears. Yep. So we have to make sure we take care of the, of the mothers and the cubs. So polar bears have a one pound cub. When they're born, they're just this big and they don't have any fur on them. And they're born inside of a snow den, which is really kind of their protective home. And they stay inside of that snow den for eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks as they grow up to be large enough in order to stay uh, with mom in the Arctic. So they'll pop out of the snow den and if they're a male polar bear, that'll be the last time they ever spend in a den. The females, once they become pregnant sometime later in their life, once they reach adulthood, they would den again. But polar bears, unlike other bears, the male polar bears won't go into den anymore. They'll stay out on the sea ice and hunt. So these little polar bear cubs, they'll hang out with mother for two to three years while they learn to become a full polar bear. You know, they're almost like in polar bear school. You know, how do you, how do you live out on the sea ice? How do, you, how do you make a living out there? And that's, that's really important time for, for, for polar bears. Mm -hmm. 
Can I just add something to that? Totally. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, because we were talking about how their skin is black. They're actually, when they're born, they're completely pink with this very short fuss of hair. And then after a couple of months, then their uh, skin will turn black. So I think Katie may have a question here It's for kind of everybody. like a quiz, I think. Ooh, we'll see who is quiz. listening, like mm. a pop quiz. So I'm going to take you through a little, so we can move our bodies a little bit. We're going to talk about senses and the polar bear's senses and our senses. So let's go through our five senses and we'll point to the parts of our body where we'll find those senses. So we have the sense of sight. So everyone point to their sense mm -hmm. of sight. And our sense of hearing, right? Depending on how clean your hands are, our sense of taste. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have our sense of smell. And then our sense of touch. Okay, we're going to decide which one is the most important to a polar bear. But I think Taya actually might have snuck that in. So I this is a, a bit of a pop quiz <laughs> to see who is listening. So if you think that a po that the most important sense to a polar bear is its sense of hearing, I want you to put your fingers on your ears, but don't cover them. You need to listen. <laughs> if you think their most important sense is their sense of touch, I want you to show me sense of touch. If you think the most important sense is a sense of smell, put your finger on your nose. Oh, I see a lot of fingers on noses. I hope those fingers smell good. <laughs> because you're right, you guys. Isn't that right? That their sense of smell is very important. And maybe you could explain a little bit more, one of you ladies, about why that is. Without giving too much away okay. again. Um, but their sense of smell and how far they can smell is really great if they want to try to find their prey species. It's great if they want to try to find another mate, as well as it's a really good kind of defense mechanism to smell if there's any bigger bears in the area, if you're a female and there's some males in the area, um, and really just kind of your surroundings and, what, and what's going on around you. So, Melissa, are you saying that they can tell who's near them just by smelling them? Hmm. That is what I'm saying. Yes. That's pretty wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. stand up. Wow. Smell a little bit. See if there's danger coming. They might be able to smell their lunch okay. as well. Mm -hmm. Their lunch mm -hmm. as well. Lunch. Yeah. It sounds like pretty yeah. important stuff. We do have one more question from Mr. Carlton's class. He his kids are wondering how long generally do polar bears live? What's their lifespan? Ooh, that's a good one. So okay. I want to answer yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the oldest polar we know of, she actually turned 42 before she passed away. But she was in a zoo. So in a zoo, you know, humans take care of the animals. And even if they're sick and not feeling so well, we take care of them. But out here in the wild, life is a little bit rougher. So generally, maybe mid-20s would be how old the polar bears get. The females tend to get a little bit older than the males, just because the males fight over the females during mating season. And that kind of wears, wears on them. Thanks. So do we have another quiz here, Katie? <laughs> It's, it's been, you know, it's a busy day out here. Do we have another quiz? I'm, yeah, oh, I think we're, about, I think I, we're, gonna I think we're moving on here. to that. <laughs> okay, you're right. Okay, so we have some pretty awesome pictures for you guys. So we're going to do a show of hands. We're going to go through a few foods. And when you just, when you think that's a polar bear's favorite food, I want you to raise your hand, okay? So if you think a hamburger is a polar bear's favorite food, put your hand up. I'm gonna put my hand up, I like <laughs> hamburgers. I feel like, like you said earlier, BJ, maybe if a polar bear had a hamburger close by, they might think that's pretty delicious. I'm guessing. Okay, okay. if you think, what's our next picture there? If you think, fish is is a polar bear's favorite food put your hand up we might not have a picture of a fish a couple hands. had a couple hands fish okay. fish is delicious i we had that for dinner last we night did. some yeah. fresh walleye it was pretty awesome okay if you think uh walrus is a polar bear's favorite mm. food mm. put your hands on your head we'll do something different this time oh lots of people I'm think walrus. My answer. 
You're going to change it. You think it might be walrus? It might be walrus, yeah. <laughs> okay. If you think a seal is a polar bear's favorite food, oh. put oh, your wow. hand up. Oh, we have lots oh, of yeah, seals. That looks, that looks I see it. <laughs> <laughs> You nice. might be wrong, BJ, about the walrus. I might have been wrong I about the walrus. I wonder if one of these lovely That's scientists okay. could, could explain what, what the polar bear's <laughs> favorite food is and why. Well, do you want to? Sure, I'll take it. All right, that's fine. <laughs> um, so bears do can eat anything and and oh. may eat anything that they come across, but you guys got it right. Seals are their favorite prey oh. item, in particular ring seal, which I believe you can see the picture of her right now. It's a bit smaller and it's kind of available to bears throughout their the Arctic. Um, but actually, there are some bears that do enjoy eating walrus from time to time. Okay, if so I wasn't totally available. wrong. Not totally. totally wrong. <laughs> okay. You are totally wrong. Thank walrus you. was another <laughs> option. Yeah, but they will come, anything they kind of come into contact, they will eat, but their favorite would be uh, the ring seal in particular, just because it's a bit smaller in size and a little bit easier for them to handle um, and capture. We did have a question come up as you were answering oh. that from Miss Peters in Angus with her grade two class. And they're wondering, okay, polar bears like to eat seals, but is there anything that likes to eat polar bears? Ooh, that's a great Ooh. question. That is a great question. I'm curious. Um, so polar bears, for the most part, if we're talking about the natural ecosystem are your top predators within the Arctic uh, food chain. So they're kind of sitting at the top. So there's really not too much uh, that are eating uh, those polar bears. There are cases where there's some, some harvesting where um, local communities are capturing or harvesting those bears and then are um, eating the meat, using the fur, using kind of that entire bear to kind of um, help them sustain or, or for their uh, sustainability. Um, yeah, feeding them, mm -hmm. kind of sharing that meat throughout the community as well as feeding pets and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you have some Actually, there's you know? also, there were some scientists who were working with Greenland sharks. Oh. And Ooh. when they dissected the sharks, they found remains of polar bears in their stomachs. Wow, but whether they were hunting the polar bears or whether they just found a dead polar bear and ate it, we don't know. That's pretty wild. That's neat. A polar bear eating shark. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty awesome. That's pretty yeah. neat. I see a whole bunch of hands going up of kids around in the other classrooms. So if you have a question, we're not going to answer, answer your questions right now, but tell your teacher who's in the room with you what your question is and write it down and we'll try and get to them at the end. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Are polar bears dangerous to other polar bears? Mm. Mm. Well, they can be. Would that be a would that be a risk for another oh, polar bear? Would, yeah. yeah. So they could be especially. So there are times where some younger male bears will kind of play and um, really practice their fighting uh, or their fighting strategies. But then there are times like during the mating season where there could be a couple of males that might be fighting over a female, um, and so some of those bears might get injured. Um, there's other times where uh, one bear could have could be feeding on a seal and then another larger bear is going to come and then kind of take that seal away from that one. We watched a cool little video this morning on that. And so there could be times where bears are getting injured and that um, might uh, mm -hmm. kind of be tricky for their survival. Sure. So if polar bears favorite food are seals, how do they catch them? So there's a couple of different ways that seals might catch, or sorry, bears <laughs> might catch a seal. I don't think seals are catching bears. No. Um, so earlier on in the season, there are times where bears will, will try to go after seals in their birth layer, kind of they'll hop up and then pounce down and try to get the young pups of the seals. There are other times where uh, some of you in some of the more northern communities may have seen uh, little breathing holes along the sea ice. And so there are times where bears will kind of 
sit by that hole. They could sit there for a few minutes, maybe get bored. Uh, but they could also sit there for hours, just waiting for a seal to kind of pop up um, and then hope that they're lucky and catch the seal that way. I'm catching a common theme here, right? They have to be on something in order to catch these seals. They do have to be on something. You're very correct. What is this statement. thing? What is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the sea ice, oh, which is very ice. important uh, for bears acting as a platform one way uh, in order to capture their prey species. It's very important. So polar bears need sea ice in order to catch seals. Yeah, in order to catch seals, in order to travel, in order to find their mate. Number of reasons why bears might need sea ice. So why can't they just catch seals by swimming? It would just be, there are cases where, where they'll do an aquatic stock, but for the most part, it's really energy intensive. And so they're gonna kind of use up some of those energy resources. Um, to really kind of catch those prey species in some of that open water or, f or really from, from the water. The sea ice is a really, it's a much easier kind of platform in which they can use, not as energy intensive and um, really help them kind of access their prey species. And it's really not about just the top of the sea ice, is it? It's, it's the sea ice is the entire habitat. Some people have described it as almost like an upside down garden. I think Katie's got a, a graphic up there. And if you look, there's in, maybe if you're in the north and you live near sea ice, this is you know, quite obvious to use. For, for me, I didn't grow up near sea ice, so I didn't know about this, but there's all kinds of things that live underneath the sea ice that make the world tick for the polar bear, right? We've got algae growing on the bottom of the sea ice. <clears throat> little uh, diatoms, somebody called them once squiggly diddlies under there, <laughs> you know, uh, and then we have little fish eating the, mm -hmm. the diatoms. Mm -hmm. Then we have seals eating the fish and then the polar bears on top. It's a pretty simple system, but without that sea ice, you don't have that platform oh, yeah. and the whole system breaks down. And everything's kind of relying, everything's linked by that food web and everything's linked and dependent on that sea ice and on that platform. So Mr. Carlton's class is also wondering then if once this, because the sea ice sort of dissipates at different mm. points of the year. So when the sea ice is not here and they can't be on the ice to hunt, do they hibernate? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. So the, I think you mentioned it earlier. Uh, but the only polar bears that actually go into a den for a long period of time are the pregnant females. Uh, they'll be in there, like you said, you know, they actually go into a den even before they uh, give birth to the cubs. And then they spend time in there with their cubs also. And they do this in the fall, in the middle of winter. Um, but at that point in time, you know, even though up here in the high Arctic, it's completely dark at that time of year you still have the polar bears just roaming the sea ice all the time looking for seals. Interesting. So what's happening to the ice? Well, so now you know, if you didn't before, that <laughs> if you don't have any sea ice, you don't have any polar bears. Well, right now we have polar bears right here and there's no sea ice, but they're waiting for it to come back. Uh, if you have the whole year without sea ice or really long periods, you can't have polar bears because they need that platform to catch the seals from. And I'm sure some of you have heard that the sea ice is shrinking. Uh, it's disappearing more and more. And this is because we are burning fossil fuels for energy. Um, and when you burn fossil fuels, it releases this gas called uh, CO2 uh, or carbon, carbon dioxide. And when that gas gets into the atmosphere that's around the earth, and that's otherwise protecting us. Uh, when we release excessive amounts of this gas into the atmosphere, it acts like a heat trapping blanket. So really it's keeping the earth from cooling off to, to temperatures that would be good for polar bears and for sea ice and for us. Uh, and everything is heating up. And that means the sea ice is also disappearing. Well, so I think we've taught a lot about polar bears I here. So. I wonder if we shouldn't get into some polar bear questions. I think that would be really good. And I think we'll let uh, Mally moderate which school goes first. So you guys probably have some questions that you've built up over the last, last 30 minutes or so. Um, also, if you have uh, students or community members in your community that would like to share about how 
things might be changing in your community, particularly in the schools that are in the Arctic. That would be really interesting for us to hear mm -hmm. about. Absolutely. So uh, I'm not sure which school we're going to go with first, but Mally, I'll let you take on that role. Yeah, I know that uh, there are two questions from Mind Center that they sent to me. So, Mr. Carr's class, would you like to ask your questions? Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Lanny had a question. So, Lanny, do you want to ask your question? Why aren't polar bears black or what? Black or brown? Are there any polar bears that are black or no, brown? No, why aren't oh, they? Why aren't they? Why are they not black or brown? Well, my guess is that if you're out on the sea ice and you want to hunt seals, it's kind of nice to be white. Um, you know, when you're sneaking up on a seal, they do that. They'll move very slowly, the polar bears. And then when the seal looks up, they'll just freeze. And then once the seal relaxes and looks back down again, the bear is going to creep even closer. So, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why. It's a nice camouflage, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. That's probably the Great main question. Problem. Thank you. Uh, Kushla in Yukon, do you guys have a question? Do our friends in the Yukon have a question about polar bears? All right, yes, we do have a question. Okay, I'm going to read for Shiana. All right, Mr. Wazki will read Shiana's question. Okay, so Shiana was wondering if the animals in the Arctic will change if the climate changes there. Oh, that's a very good question. I think if, uh, if, the, if the environment changes, yeah. would they kind of evolve to, to change with it? Um, I think if we're talking about polar bears specifically, um, as they're spending more time on land, um, there's increasing temperatures, the sea ice is melting earlier, they're coming to land uh, earlier. There have been studies that have shown that bears can eat some terrestrial food, um, showing them eating some birds or some goose eggs, but for the most part, the important thing about bears is really that they're eating those seals they're eating particularly the blubber of those seals. So really a good thing to remember is that polar bears love fat and they really need that fat in order to survive for the rest of the year. So they'll put on a lot of weight. Um, some of the bears that we're seeing here now in the fall have come off of the sea ice. They're a little bit fattier and they really need to be fat in order to um, give them energy for the rest of the year. And while they're kind of waiting, to get their next prey or their next seal. So they really do love that fat and they need that fat in order to, to survive. So are there animals that are normally in other places that come into the water because the water's open more now because the ice is melting? I'll talk. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, there, there are uh, animals as well. So in previous years, the sea ice has been a little bit thicker um, so it's kind of closed off some certain animals, some certain whales that have been uh, kind of blocked from coming into the Arctic. So if you guys ever look at a beluga or narwhal or bowhead, those are all whales that are found within the Arctic. And you'll notice they don't have a dorsal fin. But if you guys have ever seen a killer whale, you can see that they have that large uh, dorsal fin. And that's, so that's the one on their back? That one on their back, yeah, uh -huh. that points straight up. Um, that one's kind of limited them in entering the Arctic. They don't really like to be in that thick and that heavier sea ice. Um, but now that temperatures are warming, there's more open water, the sea ice is melting earlier and freezing later. Some of those killer whales are starting to come into the Arctic a little bit more now than they would have say 20 or 30 years ago interesting good question uh, thanks for that great information dear lake we haven't heard from you because i know that you had microphone um issues so is there a question from our friends in deer lake yep. can you hear us yep hi right, we have one question adam do you want to ask uh -huh. yep, what's go. harmful to the polar bears what is question? Yeah. Great question. Polar bears? That kind of could lead into. 
But can you see me? Yeah, they can see you. Can <laughs> <laughs> they see us? Can they see us? They can't see, they can't see, see you. Can see you. We can see you. We, we yeah. see you, yeah. 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 So the question was, what is harmful to polar bears? Oh. Yeah, that was the question. What was what oh, is yeah. harmful to the polar bears? Right. Well, first of all, the disappearing sea ice is harmful to polar bears. Again, uh, you know, because without sea ice, you no know, polar bears, because they can't eat that good seal fat. But apart from that, there's actually also quite a bit of pollution in the high Arctic. And a lot of this these chemicals like to accumulate in the fatty tissue of the animals. And so when polar bears are eating seal fat, in addition to getting the, all those lovely calories, uh, they're also getting a lot of these different chemicals into them. And those chemicals can have all sorts of different health effects on the bears that may you know, it'll affect, affect their health, like their liver and their kidney, uh, their reproductive organs, sometimes even their brain. So the pollution you're talking yeah. about is can you see it with your eyes? You can't actually see this pollution with your eyes. It's um yeah, it's too microscopic for us to see. But if you have an a laboratory, you can take a fat sample from a polar bear, for example, and you can analyze it. And most of these chemicals, they actually come from down south. So it's everything, you know, down south that we use in, in our everyday lives, like pesticides or um, fire re flame retardants, or what is <clears throat> sorry, what is used in production, and it comes north with the wind and with the ocean currents. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's pretty harmful to polar bears. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, great answer. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing all of the dangers to polar bears, or some of the dangers. Um, at Washoe in uh, Fort Severn, do you guys have a question? Miss Ludette's class, do you guys have a question? Yeah, Cortez is going to ask. Go ahead. We have polar bears in Fort Severn, and I want to know how fast do they swim? Ooh, how Ooh. fast do they swim? How fast do they swim? <laughs> that is a really good question. Okay. We know how long they can hold their breath for. Yeah. Well, how long is that? Yeah. How long? The furthest three? swim. How long is the holding their breath? Is Three, three and a half minutes? Something three and a three and a half minutes, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. The longest swim is a good one. Yeah. I don't remember the actual speed, but I can tell you that they're not as fast as seals. <laughs> that's as, as, yeah. They're definitely not as fast as seals. Yeah. But we do know how fast they can run, though. We do. Right? Very fast. Like 30 <laughs> to 35 miles an hour, which would be, what is that, like almost 50 kilometers an hour? Something like wow. that. Yeah. So that's faster Pretty than fast. I think just about anybody yeah. here on the buggy can run. Yeah. But I will say though, even though polar bears aren't, you know, Olympic swimmers uh, in terms of, of uh, speed, they can swim for a really long time. So the longest swim that we know of was a female, an adult female that actually swam for nine days continuously. Wow. And I think it was how much a mile? Oof. A couple hundred miles, I think, at least. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember exactly. It was about six or seven hundred kilometers. Yeah. That she swam in that period. Wow. So. I think Wasaho had one more question. I saw a second hand up there. Ludette, <coughs> is there another question in there? Yeah, Karina's going to ask. Go ahead, Karina. How little are the cubs? How small are the cubs? Ooh. Ooh that's a good you want to? Well, when they're born, they're only about one pound. They're pretty small. Um, they're, they don't have any hair, really. And then they're blind. And then they eventually uh, drink a lot of the milk from their mom and then eventually grow and grow until they're ready to kind of go off on their own. And about, um, I'm not sure how much they would be when they're So when they come out of the mom. den, they're about, what is it, about 15 or 20 pounds. So... Yeah, 10, kilograms. 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 15 kilos. Kilograms. And then they're going to stick around with their mom for two to three oh, wow. years. And, mm. you know, if you have a, a male bear, a single male bear with a with a single mom, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell who's who. Mm. 
Uh, it looks like just two bears kind of palling around, like two buddies, but it could be a mom and cub. You can usually tell, though, by the behavior uh, who the cub is, because one's kind of like, hey, kid, get over here. And then the kid, <laughs> the cub is just wandering around, not listening to mother. So, um, you know, you got to look closely. Yeah. So we do have a question from Annette Berry, actually from Kiwitnik Ogimakanak. She's a literacy coach. She's wondering how we get around the tundra without affecting the polar bears very much and without, you know, maintaining safety. So is there something yeah. that we use here to be safe? Yeah, so we're kind of in a polar bear monster truck right now. It's a tundra buggy and Casey's bringing up a slide of that right now. Um, you can see here, it's got very large tires and a big white box on top. And so we're inside of that box right now. Um, this in the front part there where the windshield is, there's a big broadcast studio and that's where we're reaching out to you from. Mm. This thing allows us to travel slowly on the tundra here and look for polar bears, it allows us to stay warm and safe and also allows the polar bears just to kind of do what polar bears would be doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is just napping outside the window. It doesn't really mind that we're here um, and uh, we can just kind of watch and see see what it does throughout the day as we as we stay safe up up high and in, inside. We did have some video of a polar bear we saw yesterday, right? Could we show that maybe? Oh, and we should definitely show that. We I had think a pretty neat. We had an awesome that, day yesterday. I think it was kind of wondering what we were doing in here. Uh, oh, we'll oh, bring that. We'll try to we'll bring it up later. It. Yeah. Uh, if we can. Um, but we had okay. a bear that came and walked up to us and and, and just kind of laid its head on a rock and, and watched us for a while. <laughs> Cool. Um, and we have a, um, just to give Exarni a chance to uh, ask their question. Okay, go ahead, Exarni. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear us? Yep. yep. All right. Samson has a question. Are polar bears' foreheads hard? Ooh, are polar bears' foreheads hard? Ooh. Is that the question? Are polar yeah. bears' fore foreheads hard? We can look at them over there for Well, no, I, okay. <laughs> Let's see. So, I mean, <laughs> it's a good question. I've never been asked that before. So all the points to you. Um, so because polar bears eat mainly the fat of the seals, it's really something soft. They don't bite into the bones of the animals they catch or anything. Uh, actually, there have been some studies that show that polar bear skulls are quite flexible. I mean, you can't bend them, you know, mm -hmm. but compared to other uh, big predators, they have quite flexible skulls. Maybe it's also because when they drag those big seals out of the breathing holes, you know, they have to be a little bit flexible because that's a lot of weight. Um, I, it's just my guess, but yeah. So I don't think they have a very hard skull or forehead. Hmm. Yeah. That's a that's a really it's unique question, Exarni. Thanks. And I have the same, I've been texted the same question from several schools. Um, and maybe this will be a good way to segue into the end. Um, since we, many of us live so far away, how can we help the polar bears, even from living at a far distance? I think that's a really nice question to mm -hmm. end on. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you guys live in a very unique place. And maybe we could kind of tailor our answer to where you guys live. Yeah, that's a great idea. So we talked about that this morning and you ladies came up with some good practical things that the kids could do mm -hmm. uh, to help the polar bears in their local community. And um, I know that Taking It Global has a really wonderful app um, called Commit to Act and you can sign up or download this app and there's simple ideas of things that you can do if you're not you know, if you're living in the Arctic, but also if you're in Toronto, you can, it tracks all the wonderful activities that you could possibly do to help um, the polar bears and also reduce uh, climate change. But uh, let's uh, talk about the ones for the Nunavut school, shall we? Yeah. So one of the things that we talked about is that, um, as you were saying, that polar bears are really curious and they want to bite into everything they see. And when they're on land and, you know, they're just waiting for the sea ice and they're waiting for the seals, uh, if they find some trash lying around, they may well bite into that. Um, some people, it, when they've been analyzing or looking at what's inside a polar bear stomach, of dead polar bears, 
obviously. <laughs> and they've actually find, found a lot of plastic bags, for example. And so just one of the really easy things you can do if you're living in polar bear country is to make sure that your trash goes into the trash can um, and is, is handled properly instead of flying around because it may well end up in a polar bear stomach. And of course, we don't really want that to happen. I think that's a pretty unique answer mm -hmm. because most of the time we're not chatting with students who mm -hmm. live in polar bear country. Most yeah. of the time we're chatting with students that are much further south. So uh, I think that's the first time we ever got to give that answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also it's important what you're doing right now is helping polar bears. You're learning about polar bears and you're, you're, you're paying attention and you're engaged. I think that's really important. And you can mm -hmm. talk to your friends and your family about the things that you're learning. And that's, you can be a very influential person just by uh, learning and then repeating what you learn. We do have a really neat um, page of information uh, that, that we're going to share out to all the classrooms. So the teachers will have time to go through this with their students. Um, if uh, Do you want to maybe speak about, do you, are you familiar with this page here, BJ, the one that's up on the? Actually, I'm not overly okay, familiar with that one. Oh, OK, yeah. so this is uh, uh, lots of different actions that uh, individuals could do to help polar bears. So um, this could be you and your community or maybe your friends further south. Um, hmm. So this is kind of a neat little picture that uh, that you could share out and that's available. So we'll um, email it to yep. all the classrooms participating. And then I'll also be emailing out a survey uh, for you guys to fill out just so these guys can get some feedback for their incredible work and this web, uh, webcast because it's all, we always wanna learn how to do things better. Well, I do anyway. <laughs> Scientists, you know. it's, it's constant trial yeah. and error. That's your job, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there might be some other uh, teachers that have tuned in that aren't on the two-way conversation here. There is a, a get involved section on the Polar Bears International website. So feel free to, to jump on there and check it out. We've got lots of resources for students and teachers. Um, and so February 27th, that's a pretty special day for you guys, we right? Do. We have yeah. International Polar Bear Day on February 22nd, or 27th, 27th I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so come back and visit Polar Bears International there and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and see what's going on. There's lots of lesson, like uh, te teacher packages and instructional videos. So there's lots more information that you can follow up on after this uh, webcast. So, yeah. So we just want to thank all of you guys for tuning in today for all of the great questions. I want to thank the panelists for coming up and, and helping us out. And Katie as well, taking it global and connected north. It's no always a pleasure to be working with you guys. Frontiers North Tundra Buggy Adventure is a big one. They give us this vehicle. So thanks to those guys, as well as uh, Canada Goose for all their support. So I think KT is going to close us out here with the bear that we saw yesterday, uh, the sleepy bear on the rock. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cute. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. It yeah, was really thanks, fun. Everybody. That was good. Um, good job, you guys. Yeah, that was awesome. Went good. To see the bear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just like good. Nice. Right on. Mm -hmm. It was good. Yeah, it was good. Really good. Yeah. It was a good job. It was I like the interactive part. Yeah. We should do more of that yeah. for the next ones. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck getting the teams to do that. Whatever. We can make them. <laughs> oh no, they'll like it. High school kids like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Totally. Oh, apparently we're still on. Oh yeah, he can just see us. Oh. <laughs> oh, whoops, it's all backwards. I forgot about that, KT. Oh. i show you how to fix that. <laughs> oh, my husband says he can still hear us, just so you know. Oh, cool. Yeah.